Before we get to the meat of uh, this presentation, I want to kind of set the scene a little bit um, and uh, kind of frame where we are in computing history. So let's go back a little bit to 1971 and Intel writes computing history by releasing the first commercially produced uh, microprocessor, the Intel 4004. Um, and this was, like I said, pretty significant because it was the first commercially produced um, microprocessor. And Intel didn't stop there. They, uh, you know, as we all know, kept uh, producing more and more chips. And just in those three years between um, the 4004 and the 8080, they more than doubled the number of transistors in, um, in these chips. Um, just a few years after that, again, uh, you know, they produced one of the most um, infamous um, chips ever produced, the AT86, with 29,000 transistors. Um, you probably already understand where I'm going with this. This is something that uh, one of the Intel uh, co-founders, uh, Gordon Moore, coined as uh, Moore's law. Initially, he said every Every year, the tr number of transistors are going to double. Eventually, he kind of retracted that statement and said, OK, maybe only every two years. But basically, throughout computing history so far, this pretty much um, held true, um, more or less until now. Um, last year, Apple gave a really cool keynote um, when they were releasing the M2 chip, where they're using, this is kind of a marketing term, the five nanometer uh, technology. Nothing's actually five nanometers in this stuff. Um, they're actually, the, the, but they made a really interesting statement in this keynote. They said some of the components in these chips are now 12 nanometers wide. Um, and the reason uh, this is important is uh, we have known physical limits of how small we think transistors can get, you know, unless there's a completely new breakthrough and, you know, we may not be producing silicon chips at all anymore. And a single silicon chip, uh, a single silicon atom is what we think is the theoretical physical limits of how small we can make a single transistor. And so, you know, going um, after Moore's law, assuming that we can actually still economically uh, produce chips that go, get smaller and smaller, we're still pretty close actually to, you know, the physical limits um, known, known to us. And so uh, that means, you know, at least the way that we know Moore's law, it is definitely ending. However, um, my thesis is basically um, long live Moore's law, although not in the way, you know, that it originally was uh, stated. And basically, the way I think uh, computing history is going to continue from this point onwards is in two ways. We're going to continue to build faster systems through either building specialized hardware, and we're already seeing this in the AI space. There's a super interesting company called Grok, G-R-O-Q, uh, that are producing specialized chips only to do one very specific task, which is inference, for example, for the Llama models. And they're three times faster than any, anyone else using you know, the most high performance NVIDIA chips at the moment. Um, and so that's something that I, I have no, no expertise in, so I chose not to solve that problem. And uh, the other thing that I think is going to happen is that we'll actually use the hardware that we have much more efficiently. And so this is basically uh, where I think we are in computing history and something that we need to solve. And the way that we can solve this is through actually understanding where our resources are being spent, and therefore we can do something about that. Because up until now, we kind of didn't really have to care about how fast, um, you know, how, how much CPU resources are being spent by our applications because, you know, they were doubling in resources every couple of years anyway. So uh, I'm Frederick. Uh, I've kind of de dedicated the last three years uh, of my life to solving this problem and probably the foreseeable future of my life as well. Um, you may know me through my work um, on Prometheus. I created the Prometheus operator as well. Kind of a lot of things that connected uh, Kubernetes and Prometheus I worked on for a very long time. I was architect for all things observability at Red Hat uh, for a while. Everything databases, distributed systems, um, performance engineering is kind of my thing. And the reason why um, we're here today is because of this live stream that we've been doing on a weekly basis where we pick an open source uh, project. Probably we'll, we'll see a lot of the um, projects that you know, you're probably using or that you've seen at this conference already. Um, and we try to run them. Probably we already run them ourselves in production. If we don't, we try to find someone in the community who does uh, so that we can get some real um, you know, representative profiling data 
um, from these from these projects uh, to analyze, to improve, and then ultimately, hopefully, you know, to merge those pull requests and make um, all infrastructure in the world less use less uh, CPU. So we've had a, a bunch of really awesome successes with this. We uh, kind of reduced the baseline of all Cilium installs worldwide by 4%. Uh, we've made some of the software we write 99% faster. Um, we made ContainerD installs worldwide uh, use less 4% less resources. Uh, we made kubectl diff 10 times faster. Uh, so a bunch, of, um, a bunch of really cool wins that we've already gotten just in a couple of um, episodes. And how did we do this? Uh, like I said, um, we do this using profiling. And just to make sure we pick up everyone uh, kind of from zero, um, profiling, basically the way profiling works is that we X amount of times per second, we look at what is the current function call stack. Right? And using this, we, if we see the same function call stack multiple times, we can build statistics and essentially infer, OK, if we're seeing the same thing multiple times, that statistically means we spend more time processing this function. And the longer we do this, the better you know, statistical significance we get, the more representative it becomes, basically. We can then use that and do some really interesting analysis so that we can aggregate this and understand where is all of this time being spent. So, a typical Let's Profile episode, we've done just about 20 of, the, of these so far, uh, looks something like this. We f find some profiling data, like I said, either from someone in the community, like you, um, or we run it ourselves already. Uh, we then use this profiling data uh, to kind of figure out what is the thing that we want to optimize, uh, because we have you know, actual production use that this profiling data is describing to us. Uh, we write a benchmark for this particular function, for example, and then we try to optimize it. And most of the time, we're kind of successful with this, but um, sometimes also not. It's completely unscripted, by the way. We only grab the profiling data beforehand. We don't try out uh, to optimize anything. There have been episodes where we were not particularly successful, but I've already shown you um, a bunch of examples where we were very successful. Let me quickly sh give you an example of what this might look like. I'll pull up um, our demo instance from uh, the Parka server here. This is an open source project that we uh, created at Polar Signals, where we kind of profile all of your production infra infrastructure all the time. And then down here, we can basically see where all of this CPU time is being spent. And then we can do stuff like, uh, you know, we want to look at all the whoops, profiling data for container DSHIM, and then we can kind of dive into this um, and figure out what is the function that we want to optimize, like I said, and then write, we write a benchmark and try to optimize that. Typically, what we try to do is we try to uh, publish the prof profiling data like a day in advance or something and publicize it on Twitter and uh, let uh, the audience kind of participate in this. It's kind of a fun format. Uh, but yeah, this is ba basically our starting point, um, and from there, let me restart it from here. Um, we then, uh, like I said, create a benchmark that may look like something like this. This is actually an, uh, a real example of when we optimize ContainerD, like I, said, like I mentioned earlier. We create a benchmark. We run it so that we have a baseline, you know, where we're starting, so that we can then have a quick feedback cycle uh, to know whether we're actually improving, how much we're improving, and so on. And then we come to the actual optimizations. Um, and we've kind of grouped all of the optimizations in a couple of um, categories. The first one that you're always going to want to make sure is that you're actually using the correct approach, the right data structures, the right, right algorithm, algorithms. This is kind of the highest level, right? You always want to make sure this is where uh, you start with. This is also typically where you get the biggest wins. Um, however, um, it doesn't hurt to all, all, always just have a look at the profiling data across your entire infrastructure because there's always something that um, you know, we may not anticipate um, while we're writing the code um, of how the software is going to uh, behave. And we've definitely seen a fair share of allocations, uh, like memory allocations, that people didn't intend for there to be there. But you know, software, writing software is hard. Um, so you definitely always want to then check out um, removing allocations, inlining, and uh, some eventually vectorizing your, your code. But I'll go into each of these um, with examples. So the first one, we were actually, this is one of our uh, 
earlier episodes where we were optimizing the Kubernetes kubelet. Um, and we figured out that one of the really like, resource intensive things that the kubelet does is it, it basically keeps checking uh, what are all the volumes that need to be mounted, right? I guess this makes sense, right? We have a bunch of uh, Kubernetes pods that are running on our hosts, and we, it needs to make sure that all the volumes that these pods may be mounting um, into you know, containers actually need to be um, available. Um, and it turns out, even though you know, there's probably not a whole lot of um, volumes on every node, it still uses a data structure that is meant to, to store a lot, of, um, a lot of items. And so there's actually a possibility to optimize this because it typically deals with relatively few entries, you know, maybe in the tens of thousands, but not in the hundreds or millions of entries. Um, so this is roughly what the code looks like, but it's not really all that important. The more important part is this is the, what the data structure looks like, um, or conceptually what uh, maps look like in Go. Um, you have kind of an array of buckets, and then you follow a linked list, or this is more a gen generic example of any hash map. However, because basically all the volumes are just um, file system paths, right? We can actually do way better with data structures that are optimized for prefixes, right? So these are called trees, T-R-I-E, um, where the tree essentially have, has all of these prefixes and it just walks the tree. It's way cheaper to walk this, this tree than to um, iterate over a map in Go. And so this actually resulted in a 10% uh, baseline improvement on the kubelet. This means every kubelet in the world uses less 10% less resources. This means it uses less energy. You know, there's more uh, space on our nodes for our actual workloads and all of these things. The next thing that we keep seeing in over, over, and over, and over again in many episodes is uh, memory allocations. Or generically, we can talk, talk about this as um, escape analysis, because basically what happens in a garbage collected language like Go, the compiler decides at compilation time more or less where um, memory is going to be allocated. Can it be allocated on the stack? Or do we have to kind of go into main memory and um, allocate on the heap? And that is an expensive um, operation. So to kind of amortize that, one of the good things that you can do is to pre-allocate all the memory that you're going to need so that you don't need to make all of these tiny allocations all over the place that are all very expensive. You can kind of do one very big allocation and therefore save um, doing all of these very expensive small allocations. Um, I have uh, another, uh, one example of how this can be solved, which is just by reusing a... Um, uh, a, a piece of memory that you just allocate once and you keep reusing the same buffer. This is one way that, uh, that you can also, or another way that you can solve this. Um, what's kind of problematic about this is if you're in a multi-threaded environment, um, this is not thread safe. And so in that kind of case, you would want to use something like a buffer pool where every time that you require a buffer, you take it out of the pool, you do your operation and then put it back into into the pool, but what this still prevents is that you keep doing new allocations every time um, you, need, you need a buffer. And uh, this is essentially the optimization that we used for ContainerD. Again, made all ContainerD installs on the planet by about 4% um, uh, use four percent less CPU. Again, more space for our actual applications on our nodes that we're paying good money for to, our, uh, to the cloud providers. Um, the next one, um, is inlining. This is actually a compiler optimization where the compiler decides, okay, actually it's not worth uh, doing an, an entire function call to this next function. I'm just going to include all the executable code in this function that, it's, um, that it is calling. Uh, that, yeah. Um, and this is actually surprisingly um, effective of an optimization um, because we don't need to do all of this uh, work of setting up the stack and returning back to uh, you know, executing the code that we left off from. So in this case, I um, forced the compiler not to inline the add function over here. So what it does is you know, it does the setup of the stack over here. It then calls um, the add function. The add function does its thing, returns, and you know, all of this uh, back and forth is super, super expensive. And when the compiler decides that it, it, it inlines, then we can see over here, all of this is just 
all part of this main function. So there was no need to set up a stack. There was no need to return from the other function. Um, and if this, all of this happens in a hot loop, for example, this can be very, very um, effective of an optimization. Um, let me give you an example um, where this can be um, and how this can be super um, effective. So in, in this case, I have a function accepts interface um, that you know, accepts some, some random interface, and it calls some function on this. And we do this a million times. Um, obviously, this is, not, this is just conceptual. But um, what has to happen if I uh, don't have inlining in this case um, uh, sorry, what happens here is uh, something called dynamic dispatch. The program needs to figure out which implementation of the inf interface do I need to call to then call it. And this prevents us from doing inlining. So in this case, we have to do dynamic uh, dispatch a million times instead of being just able to call something and inline it within this hot loop. Um, and you know, if you're doing, doing something like this, there uh, can be a huge, huge saving if you can just skip that. And how can we do that? Well, um, there's a really cool feature that most recently landed in the Go compiler, but just about any compiler um, out there can do stuff like this, where you can feed the compiler profiling information, right? Um, because then the compiler knows, ah, actually, one of the most common ways of how, of which interface is being called in this hot loop is actually this specific implementation. Um, and it's essentially the same thing as introducing a type switch in Go or, you know, just making sure, okay, one of the things that we're, we definitely see often is this specific implementation. And that allows us to do inlining again. And so what we can see here in this particular case, we could save 66% um, of CPU time simply because we've given our compiler profiling information. We've not actually changed any code here. We've only done you know, profiling in production and we've given our uh, compiler um, representative code for our, um, uh, sorry, pr representative profiling data for our code. And once you've done all of these things, that's when you can think about um, vectorizing your, um, your code. And I'm not going to talk about um, all of this in a lot of detail because this would be like five talks by themselves. But long story short is um, uh, hardware these days can actually perform um, instructions that put, uh, perform multiple tasks all in one instruction cycle. And so we can actually squeeze quite a bit more performance out of um, existing hardware today simply by you know, doing multiple things all in one cycle. Um, if you're interested in this kind of stuff, um, I recommend checking out Daniel Lemire's um, blog. He blogs about this kind of stuff, especially also in uh, relation with Go all the time, but he talks about vectorization um, in a you know, very general sense as well. So kind of going back, um, this is our cheat sheet for uh, profiling and optimizing just about anything. Um, you profile, you benchmark, you optimize. Um, and the way that you're most successful at optimizing is first, you want to make sure you're using the right approach, the right data structures, the right algorithms. And only then do you go on to avoiding allocations, uh, make sure that inlining is performed where it makes sense. And then very last, you vectorize your code. So. Um, we've been doing this for a very long time um, on our code as well. And even, even then, we see on like a weekly, bi-weekly basis, still 25, 30, 50% uh, sometimes improvements simply because we're always doing this, always having this data, and we can immediately jump into our data in production and see where all the CPU time is being spent. So now you also have the tools um, to deal with the end of Moore's Law. So long live Moore's Law, and let's profile. Um, please subscribe to our YouTube channel um, and tell us what we should profile next. Thank you. I think we have a couple of minutes for questions. Thanks for the talk. Uh, can you share which versions were you fixed in Kubelet and in Container D and so on? Or do you have it somewhere in the slides or so? 
Um, be very helpful. So um, the kubelet um, patches have not been merged yet. Um, the container D ones have been merged, but I don't know exactly in which version. Um, I believe in the mo it's rolled out in the most recent um, like GKE version, so like 128. I think uh, we didn't see this anymore. Um, but yeah, it takes a while for this stuff to to land in production. So do it as early as possible so that we can you know keep getting more res resources for ourselves to spend and not on these infrastructure components. Hello. Uh, thanks for the talk. It was very nice. I have a question. How are you like checking how the escape analysis working go? Do you have any like techniques how you are approaching it? Because I think that if you look at everything, it may be hard. Any tips and tricks that you want to share? Sorry, where are you sitting? I don't the desk here. <laughs> ah, okay. <laughs> Sorry, can you repeat the, the question one more time? Sure. Uh, basically, I want to ask you how you approach the analysis of the escape analysis in Go. Do you have any tips and tricks? Because um, in my experience, it could be a lot of basically noise and how you approach to, to basically just check the things that you're mostly interested in. Yeah, great question. So um, one, there's actually a compiler flag uh, that you can pass. Um, I don't know it off the top of my head, but if you search for this, you'll find it. Um, that basically prints out all the decisions that the Go compiler makes um, in, in relation to escape analysis. And basically, you know, the way that you, you need to think about it is the Go compiler needs to make a decision of, is this going to fit on the stack? Um, and if it basically says no, or I don't know the size of this thing, um, I can't predict the size of this thing, then it's going to go on the heap, right? Um, and so that's kind of, I think, conceptually how I mostly think about it. And then, then I use the tools that tell me, you know, this thing went onto the heap because I think it's going to be too large. Okay, but the thing is that when you use it, uh, you get the output of the, of the whole, for example, application, right? Like, it's a very big kind of file. So my question is how to filter out you the only thing, the part that you want to optimize. Yeah, fair, fair enough. So I, I think there, um, it's, it's not really magic. I try to build the smallest uh, benchmark that I possibly can uh, so that, you know, it also <laughs> outputs as little um, uh, as possible. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, uh, okay. Yeah, thank you. Uh, great talk. Uh, so I think uh, my question is that you mentioned PGO. So is there any like best practice, uh, like how we can integrate PGO uh, into our pipeline, maybe CI, and improve our uh, maybe performance over time across maybe different releases? Yeah, great question. So um, actually the Go implementation of PGO is like completely state of the art. And one of the really cool things that uh, the Go compiler can, can do that many other PGO implementations struggle with is uh, source stability. Um, and more specifically, it doesn't require source stability. So in other implementations, let's say in LLVM, you have to compile your code, profile it, and uh, recompile exactly the same code um, as you profiled, right? So this, is, this can be complicated because if you actually want production uh, profiling data, it's kind of conflicting, right? In Go, this is not a requirement. And so um, basically it just tries to search for which code hasn't changed and tries to apply PGO to all of those things because it basically acknowledges that most of the time your patches are relatively small, code changes are relatively small, and so PGO still ends up being applied to just about anything, like 95% of all of your code, right? Um, and so this means that you can basically take a weekly snapshot of all of your production profiling data, um, put it you know, on an S3 bucket or whatever, um, and then download that in your CI CD pipeline, compile it, and you know, a weekly snapshot is actually sufficient to optimize most of the code paths for that week. Okay, gotcha. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I wanted to build on PGO question. How do you think open source project can use it as part of their pipelines? How do we know which production is the best production? Um, great question. So the, the cool thing about PGO is that it most of the time isn't evaluating the profiling data itself. It just wants to understand what are the code paths that have actually been taken, right? Um, and so 
actually the best thing as a community that we can do is collect all of our profiling data together, give it to, I know you're an etcd maintainer, give it to the etcd maintainer, um, and therefore etcd for the entire community can be built using PGO with all the possible code paths that actually exist um, in reality. And the cool thing about PGO is you can basically um, only win. Like the worst thing that can happen is that the binary gets a tiny bit larger, but you know it doesn't doesn't hurt to optimize the code paths that have actually been taken in reality, right? So basically, as a community, we can only win. What we should do is all put all of our profiling data together and give it back to the maintainers of all these projects. Awesome. Thanks. So when will be let's profile for etcd? Come join us ne next week. <laughs>